in an incremental technology, if you take what you currently understand and then just use a milligram of vision and extend it just a tiny bit, you understand the new technology, because it really is just a slight extension of the past. Bitcoin is a radical break from the past. And so understanding the way traditional money works doesn't help you understand Bitcoin. If anything, it hinders your understanding of Bitcoin. The people who understand Bitcoin the least are monetary economists. They cannot wrap their head around it. And they will write long theses on how Bitcoin is not money, despite the fact I've been living on it for two years. So, understanding disruptive technologies is even harder than understanding incremental technologies because the most interesting things they do have no previous parallel. Think about it this way: Who here is a fan of Star Trek? Am I the only geek in the room? All right. Great. Look back at Star Trek in the 1970s. What did they get right? They've got tricorders. They've got portable communicators. They've got video telephony. Right? They got all that. That was predictable with the technology of the 1970s. They couldn't possibly get the internet. They couldn't possibly understand them. The idea of networked information stores. They had fantastical computers that could talk to you, but they didn't have access to any data. Right? They couldn't possibly predict things like social media. And most importantly, if you pay attention, you will notice something very strange. Star Trek doesn't have any money at all. There is no money anywhere in the Star Trek universe. Why is that? Because their furthest vision of the possibility of society is a society without money, a society without a language for transmitting value, which is probably the most radical departure from reality. So, when we try to predict the future, there are certain areas that are completely dark to us. These are the areas that have never ever been seen before. These are the applications that we cannot imagine, because in order for them to come into being, many things have to fall into place. For the web to happen, you needed a common standardized transmission protocol. For the web to give birth to social media, you needed massive penetration of basic email and TCP IP connections. You needed Penetration of those connections on an always-on state, you needed the ability to have mobile devices with high-density computing in the palm of your hand that were internet-connected. All of those things had to come to fruition before social media was even possible. And so if you look at the internet in 1992, you think that it will replace the phone. Because that's the only experience you have. The internet is a fancy phone. Maybe it's a fancy phone fax, perhaps a multifunctional printer fax phone. Right? It's very fancy. And so the phone companies look at this and they say, oh, it's a fancy phone, we can do this. They were wrong, fortunately. Because otherwise, every time I went on a Skype call, there would be a little slot in the side of my computer, and I would have to deposit quarters every three seconds to make a Skype call. Fortunately, the phone companies didn't get to write the rules. They couldn't possibly predict the outcomes we saw on the internet, because most of the interesting things were not incremental improvements or extensions of the things before. They were radical departures from the past, because they created the conditions for things that were not possible before. So now go back to Bitcoin and think about this for a second. Look at the wall around you of what we've been talking about. Financial transactions. Banking, payments, it's a fancy credit card. It's PayPal, basically. It's a global PayPal, but it's not. It's not. It's something completely radically different, but we can't even see where that's going to go. And the applications that are going to happen on Bitcoin, the really, really interesting applications, 
are applications that can only happen when you have sufficient adoption and penetration of this technology. The ability to do cross-border transactions on a level that has never been done in the history of humanity before. Today, there are three billion people with no banking facilities whatsoever. Three billion more people with very limited, underbanked, as we call them, without any access to international credit, international finance. You or I can go to a brokerage website right now, and within 24 hours, have a US dollar denominated account that can trade on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. That is privilege. That is a facility afforded to less than a billion people in the world. One out of seven. The other six billion, they barely have basic checking, if that. And a lot of them live in cash or barter-based societies. So the question then you have to ask is, what happens when a farmer in Kenya who has a Nokia 1000 text messaging phone, and suddenly that phone is a Bloomberg terminal, is a loan origination terminal, is a Western Union remittance termination terminal, is a stock market, is a bank, not a terminal to a bank, but a bank on the phone, and that is afforded to the other six billion all over the world. Part of the reason Bitcoin is unstoppable is because there is this great need for this technology. All of the banks in the developing world cannot extend services to these populations. I was talking to a Brazilian banker who told me half our population is a hundred miles from the nearest branch, upstream on a canoe. And we can't serve them. But even the remotest village in the Amazonian basin has a cell phone tower, and someone in that village has a solar panel and a Nokia 1000's text phone. There are more Nokia feature phones in the world than any other kind of electronic device. It is the most massively produced device humanity has ever produced. Almost five billion people have access to cell phones. Almost three billion people have access to cell phones and do not have access to safe cleaning water, safe drinking water. Think about that. Cell phones are more widespread than water on our planet. So what happens when each and every one of those is a banker? For me, the vision of Bitcoin is not to bank the other six billion. It is to unbank all of us. We can do it. Banking is an app, but that is just the beginning. The really, really interesting things in Bitcoin happen in what I call interstitial innovation, the innovation in the gaps. The places where today's systems cannot go. Technologies have an interesting effect where they suddenly change basic assumptions. So, some of the most powerful things that happen on the internet happen not just because of connectivity, but because of the marginal cost of transmitting information over distance. So before the internet, moving information from point A to point B cost a lot of money. The internet drove that cost almost to zero. The result of that was that millions of applications that could not happen on the previous cost basis, even if we could imagine them, suddenly became possible. Right? Why on earth would you stream music instead of buy it and store it locally? Because it costs nothing. Right? And once it costs nothing and you can stream music, then you suddenly realize that ownership is kind of overrated. <laughs> if an entire generation realizes that, then intellectual property is kind of overrated. Bye-bye, recording industry. These effects happen because the technology changes fundamental cost of doing things. So let's think about what happens when Bitcoin changes the fundamental cost of transacting. 
transacting across distance, transmitting value, recording information, and recording information in an immutable way. What happens when, for the first time ever, there is a system that can evaluate rules without human intervention and be trusted without having to put trust in any single human? 